speech is any expression through words or images or symbols. Uh, and it doesn't have to even convey an articulable idea. It can be a matter of self expression. And fortunately, the U.S. Supreme Court has long recognized that there should be no value judgment, uh, no requirement that speech has to convey an articulable idea or that, let alone a valuable idea. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have abstract art and, you know, contemporary music and other types of what I think most people would recognize have expressive content, even if you can't paraphrase a particular message. So it's anything in the outside world that conveys a message to the seer or hearer. Or is, to or the individual who's the engaging in the expression. Okay. It can be a matter yes. of self-expression as well. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so it's, it's very broad, um, and yet, uh, as you pointed out to me in the hall down in Chapel Hill, not all speech is protected yes. by federal, and that's something I don't think really people understand I think, at all. I think that's a very and that, good and that point. And you really have to expand on that Thank just you so to much get people up the learning yes. curve. So know? to say that we have a very broad concept of what is expression, that would be considered speech uh, in the language of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law uh, abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Now let me pause mm -hmm. since we're talking about words. Congress has been universally construed by Supreme Court justices as meaning not only the national legislature, but also any government agency, any government official at federal, state, and local levels of government. So essentially, Congress has been interpreted as meaning government shall make no law. Again, that phrase also has been interpreted in a more expansive way than its literal language, not just making a law in the sense of enacting a statute, but basically take any official action. So a judge couldn't issue a contempt order or a president could not issue an executive decree abridging the freedom of speech. And notice that abridging is not as strong as prohibiting. The Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment uh, uh, outlaws law, uh, pro laws that prohibit the free exercise of religion. You look at the contrast and it seems that there was uh, concern, greater concern to rein in even restrictive measures or regulations that had a suppressive limiting effect on speech, even if not an absolute prohibition. Uh, and so then we get to the word speech and that has been construed very broadly, but not every government action Will that has some suppressive impact will be deemed to be an abridgment of the freedom of speech. So um, to say that something is speech means that you have to analyze whether a restriction on it violates the First Amendment, but a restriction will not necessarily violate the First Amendment. That depends on whether the justification for the particular restriction um, is sufficient in the particular circumstances. And that in turn depends on a series of tests that the Supreme Court has crafted over many, many decisions and many years. So, so one thing you get is the founders truly were incredible wordsmithers and worked hard on the language. And so it generally, in almost every case, meant something very, very specific. Or, other, if I can amend that slightly or amplify on it, Doug, they used very specific language when they had a specific concept. But when they were trying to embody a general open textured concept, they used general open textured, textured. language. True. And so to use the word uh, freedom and speech, these are open textured concepts Correct. that reflect an intent uh, for interpretation to be able to evolve. Correct, and, and not only that, if you think of words like, say, Congress, which, which does have a particular meaning, and if I'm a strict constructionist or a heritage uh, guy, I could say, well, you meant Congress. But really, 
from a policy standpoint, uh, if you had restricted that just to Congress versus the Senate or the President, that would have become really one of the weakest branches of government because ultimately the other branches of government would have become more powerful because they can restrict speech mm -hmm. and they would do it and there would be little old Congress sitting there being able to do nothing, right? right? So, so it, it's, it, it has to be broadly interpreted to be effective at all. And yes. I think that's been the sort of presumption, correct? Yeah, it is. That has uh, been, but okay. from the beginning and to this day, even the strongest free speech champion, including all justices on the Supreme Court who are generally very speech supportive, recognize that it is not absolute. Now, a uh, former Supreme Court justice who was thought to be a very strong defender of free speech, Hugo Black, used to say, well, the First Amendment says hey, Congress- Dick Howard's <laughs> man, by the way, keep going. Yeah. Congress shall yeah. make no law abridging the freedom of speech. And he would say, no law means yeah. no law. But he himself did not interpret the uh, provision as being absolute because he interpreted speech narrowly. Unlike mm -hmm. other justices, he said wearing a black armband isn't speech. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, it, you can interpret different words in that phrase flexibly, but the common upshot is that not every expression is constitutionally protected. Right, right. And what, what about the, um, this, this is not, I don't believe, in the Constitution. I remember taking constitutional law and thinking, getting to free speech after all the other stuff, and mm -hmm. you think, oh, well, this is going to be easy, because look, it's only about five words. <laughs> Every you know, single word is subject <laughs> to debate. Every single word has a whole <laughs> hell realm of, of law.